Um, our Sector Skill Council CEO, Amit Agarwal from NASCOM. He's going to take some time and talk about the reskilling of tech talent. So the presentation will be for about 10 to 15 minutes. And post that, we will have a discussion with our panelists on the talent and skill requir skilling requirements with Industry 4.0. And if time permits, we'll go with Q&A. So Amit, do you want to join and start off your presentation, please? Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. What a lovely day. Thank you to the UK government for inviting us for this. I don't think they're being able to hear it. So. Can you hear? Just raise your hand if you can hear. Okay, well, that's can. Perfect. So, I'm going to take about 10 minutes to give you an overview of what we're attempting to do and why. And after that, we'll move straight to the panel. So as we also went disruption, so we'll spend a minute just talking about how it's impacting. You want me to use one? Check, check. You take this off? Huh? Hello, is this my name? Okay, wonderful. So, so we're going through this massive period of disruption, right? And it's a huge opportunity for us as we go through this. Technologies are coming through, they're accelerating at a pace. That pace is leading to many companies collating huge amounts of data, especially in our country. And with all of that, we're seeing transformation is becoming the central theme for our IT, ITS industry in India and globally. That's really the context in which we wanted to talk about our transformation on the people side of it. The stakes are high for us. We're seeing the changes every single day. New companies coming up, NASCOM companies going through a huge change. These are the three things that we're actually seeing at the center of this disruption. Data, and as you think through the smart city progress in the country, as you think through this whole explosion of IoT that's going through, all the technology that's coming through, and the center of it all is the people. We have about four million people in our industry here in India, right? And one of our big goals really is to figure out what can we do to actually accelerate the ability for our people to be relevant in this new world. So that's the first piece of it. We all know we need to do something. The second piece now is interesting in terms of where we are and what we believe we see the trends to be. So one of the things that we're actually seeing, and all research shows it, but high level, close to 50% of the people in our industry will actually either have to substantially reskill themselves to be able to survive, or they will need to need completely new skills as they come through. So that's about 2 million people in our industry will need to change over the next four or five years. So for us, that's the huge challenge that we're getting through. The second piece of it, on the other hand, is all of our member firms and companies are saying that they actually don't have the right people. So on the one hand, we have people that need new jobs. On the other hand, we have companies saying that actually we can't get the people that are relevant for us today. And that's where the industry actually came together. And they came together through NASCOM to say, what can we do to actually change the way this whole piece is working? And that was the beginning of the start of this thought around future skills. We've prioritized this as the number one priority for our industry through NASCOM over the next four or five years to completely reskill both in our member firms, two million people, across our educational institutes. We have 80,000 colleges in India. Many of them actually are not meeting their enrollment rates. Only about 16% of graduates get a job in the IT industry when they come through. And that is all changing and getting less and less relevant as we move forward because they have not put the new systems in place, they have not changed their curriculum, et cetera. So that was the thinking around, how do we build an industry-driven learning ecosystem? So there's enough change going, we all know there's new tech, there's new ways to learn, et cetera. But there's enormous waste in that ecosystem. If somebody has to learn today, they aren't sure what to learn. They aren't sure what job role is going to be relevant for them. They aren't sure that if they're in a current job today, 
what are the three roles that are most relevant that they can get to in the near future with the minimal amount of effort? And that really is where this whole discussion started on how can we create an industry-driven learning ecosystem where companies from our industry actually work together to define what are the job roles of the future, what are the skills that are going to be needed for those job roles, what is it that we need to do from a career lattice perspective where people are in a certain place and they get elsewhere. And that was the start of where we got to. I think our panelists are flying away. <laughs> So these were the three goals. We worked with about 40 or 50 different companies from the industry to decide what do we want to do as an industry together and what do we not want to do. Because clearly there's no one entity that can do everything around reskilling. So the first piece was these three things. The first, discovery. How do we enable everybody in the industry for these nine or ten technologies, AI, big data, IoT, etc., to figure out what are the 50, 60 job roles in the future and what are the skills that are needed. The second, continuous learning. I think we're all clear now that the days are gone where somebody in a company will just train an employee and that employee will then be skilled for the next four or five years. That's finished. Whether it's in a college, whether it's in a company. So this entire culture change of how do we actually put in place a process, a system, a set of tech tools that allow people to learn every single day. And that's gonna be a tough journey. In addition to all the training, how do we encourage people to actually learn every single day on new things? So that's something the industry came back and said, can you actually bring somebody that can help our industry to do that? And the third thing was the marketplace. So they don't want us to create any content. What they said is there are providers across the world in every single area that we can think of, whether it's on content, whether it's on virtual labs, whether it's on assessment and credentials. And those are changing every single day. There is massive innovation happening in EdTech. So find a way that you can bring us this marketplace, bring us the best providers, integrate them into your platform. So when we need to find somebody, we can find that person within 24 hours. We shouldn't have to go through complex contracting. We shouldn't have to go through a huge discovery process of figuring out who the providers are, get them all on. So these were the three biggest goals that they had. Discovery, continuous learning, and the marketplace. And that really is what we started this journey with in terms of the ecosystem, knowing that once the ecosystem builds, it will find its own use cases. Different players will find their own value. And that's what, you know, in a few minutes, the panel's gonna actually step up and come and talk to you all about what are the sources of value they're actually finding as they work on this. So we've run a sprints. We've done about five sprints so far. We started late last year in September. September to November was really finding a partner. The BCG team worked with us to figure out what is it that we're looking for. We decided to focus finally to meet those three goals that I set out on an aggregator platform. And there's a few out there. And we finally chose Edcast. And the CEO of Edcast is sitting right here, Carl. So their team has worked very closely with us. They sort of power our ecosystem that we're building. Immediately after that, we got into prototype development. December, Jan, Feb, we built the prototype. That prototype was launched by the Prime Minister of India in February at the national NTLF conference that we do. So that was in Feb. March to May was then all about building out the platform, getting these three basic core things we talked about, discovery, learning, marketplace into play, plus signing up our member firms. So who are the firms that actually wanted to pioneer with us? And now we have eight to nine companies that came on as pioneers. Subsequent to that was actually getting those companies onboarded, their subject matter experts, their learning teams, their KPD experts, so they could figure how this platform actually fits in their overall rescaling journey. So that really was September to October. While we also increased the number of companies that came on the platform. And now finally the phase we are in now is mass onboarding. And where we are today is, these are our pioneers. We have Wipro, we have Tech Mahindra, and we have them with us today. And we have some other firms, Genpack, CGI, WNS. So we have product firms, we have global k firms, we have BPMs. We've tried to get a mix across all the different players so we can get all the use cases right. We have about 60 other firms that have signed up and nominated employees. You'll see them on the right side. So we have some of the big four that have come on. We have a bunch of the k firms. But they are actually consuming from the platform. So we have one group of firms that are working very actively to co-create the platform. And a second group of firms that are actually consuming on the platform. Our partners, 
So we have Amit Goel from edX, who's one of the first partners that came on, Microsoft, Google, IBM. A bunch of the OEM companies have come on to actually start to provide content so it can go into colleges and companies. A bunch of the MOOC providers have come on. A bunch of niche platform players have come on. The one thing we have insisted on is that anybody who wants to come on must have at least some digital capability. Because ultimately, if we have to build this digital highway, as you know, the government calls it, on learning, we need people who can come on to that digital highway, even though they may have a lot of in-prem, classroom, etc., which we will also leverage over time. So the big goal now was to bring, so now we have about 100 plus different players in the ecosystem, on this ecosystem, right? We have about 200,000 employees committed to learn. 120,000 odd have already come on board the platform. That's sort of where we are today. This is one thing that actually surprised us, to be honest, and is turning out to be the largest differentiator in terms of what the member firms are doing. So one big gap that I think many firms were facing was that while L&D teams were driving things and getting people going, it was getting difficult to actually include all the capability teams in this whole movement to the new tech and upskilling their employees. This platform and this ecosystem, for some reason, resonated significantly with the subject matter experts. And if you think about it, it's probably the one thing that the industry can do together far better than any other player could ever do, is to actually bring experts from our own industry to build learning paths, to curate content, to help figure out what is most relevant for employees, colleges, etc., to learn. And that's turned out to be a huge differentiator, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of discussion that Divya and the team will do on that after this. Our way ahead very quickly, so 2018, our goal was to get this ecosystem up and running, get 100,000 people on the platform, and to solve for our three big plays in discovery, continuous learning, and marketplace. Broadly done that, it's really, it's been a dream start for us. The collaboration of the industry coming together has been outstanding. You know, I moved from one of the member firms in April to run this for the next three years. It's just been fascinating how this industry has come together. You know, we keep saying people compete and it's true. But I think on this one piece, people have found a way to create a coalition. And it's no longer just national. We're getting a lot of interest from other countries. We're getting interest from companies across different countries as well who want to come on and help. So universities in Singapore, the Finnish government. It's fascinating, I mean, how people are coming on. At one level, it's a bit of a public good, right? Because the costs of it get defrayed across as many people as come onto the ecosystem. NASCOM itself is not in it for the money at some level where a society. So the good thing in all of this is it's actually getting run by companies, increasingly now by colleges, the first college has signed on. And we're hoping that over time now, we will start to see the different use cases come through. So with that, thank you very much for listening. It's a really surreal thing to talk and you can't actually hear anything and you're not sure what people are listening to. But it's a great experience. I'll pass it to Divya now. Thank you. So thank you, Amit. Um, we all heard from Amit how the reskilling needs are the key for our current employee workforce. So I'm going to continue this discussion with our panelists. And for that, I would like to invite Amit Goyal from edX. He's the head for India and Southeast Asia. Anurag Seth, vice president and head talent transformation from Wipro. Sanjeev Kumar, business unit head, smart cities and IoT from Tech Mahindra. Carl Mehta, Edcast, CEO and founder. And Pallavi Bakshi, VP HR from Tata Communications. All right, so. All right, so we have our panelists from both the supplier side and our clients. So um, you guys all heard Ahmed talking about the reskilling requirement and how it's an imperative today and not even an option. Almost 50% of the current workforce either needs to be reskilled or skilled, upskilled to maintain their jobs and to stay relevant in the current workforce. We also heard that 16% of the students graduating today are really getting the jobs. So obviously that's not a very high number. 
Um, and then also the culture is changing, right? We're no longer, once we get a job, we can continue doing that forever. We have to get reskilled every few years to stay relevant. So just keeping those things in, uh, in mind. So question for you, um, Anurag, right here. How are you guys addressing this whole industry 4.0 talent gaps at Wipro? Yeah, see, one of the, <clears throat> one of the fundamental things today is that Everybody in the organization has to get reskilled. You know, unlike in the past, uh, so a lot of freshers who are coming from campus versus somebody who is 15, 20, 25 years experience, they all have to learn things in a same virtual classroom. Uh, you know, and so you will find four levels of hierarchy or five levels of hierarchy learning there. So that's a new paradigm. Uh, and it is much easier for a fresher to learn because he or she has to only learn while uh, the senior guys have to unlearn first and learn again, you know, and, and that is creating a little bit of a, uh, a cultural issue where a lot of senior guys are resistant to come inside the uh, room. So the way we have done this thing is that, you know, we have categorized our learning into three areas, which is um, uh, awareness level, knowledge level, and expertise level. And a lot of new technologies, you know, that even future skills list uh, like cyber security, IoT, uh, full stack programming, uh, artificial intelligence, big data and all, you know, all these new age technologies that are there. We have actually got platforms like Future Skills and also some other platforms where, uh, uh, you know, we said it is the programs are available to people on a mobile device where while they are, you know, uh, going around, you know, uh, ordering Ubers, we call it, you know, you can actually watch a small video of seeing what blockchain is all about. One is that level. The second level that we are doing is that all the senior levels in the organization, we have said you must pick up two skills in a particular year and that is we are putting it kind of a goal and say, you know, these are the methods in which you can pick up these skills so that they as managers can also run these programs uh, when the juniors come up. And as far as juniors, which is like people, let's say, with five, six, seven year experience or, or below, for them, we are learning deep programs because they are the people, these are the people who will actually go in front of a customer and learn that. So that way we have categorized this whole thing uh, and the deep skilling programs are typically run between three months to four months where people work while they are on billable projects. They work two hours a day or 10 hours a week for a period of three to four months where they get real good expertise uh, uh, on some of these new age technologies like full stack so that they can be customer deployed. So that is how we are kind of conceptually driving it. Great. Thanks, Anurag. So uh, Sanjeev, same question to you from Tech Mahindra side. How are you guys addressing? the reskilling and scaling upskilling initiative no i think uh, the first and most important part is that uh, you know it is not only reskilling i think the most important part is how to be ready to unlearn the things that you have learned so far right because that has been the resistance and i think we all we all, we all have seen into the daily lives of it but i think uh, there is no debate that question is, is there any option? I don't think there is any option. Because in the next five years or so, the industry is going to be changed in such a way that if you are really to survive those waves, you'll have to go through this change. And I think I can take you know numerous examples of companies who are doing very well at that point of time. And I don't find them currently into the current world, right? So they're not relevant. So relevancy is become a very, very critical factor for us. So I think uh, as at Tech Mahindra, I think uh, the way Anurag uh, explained, we are also running programs which are related to, you know, dif uh, different proficiency levels. We really want to get into that level of, you know, defining that what would be relevant for let's say the zero to five years, zero to seven years of experience, what is relevant for, and there's no medicine, one common medicine for all those uh, things, right? So it has to be a very tailored, uh, made uh, focus for. One thing I would like to uh, really emphasize upon is that, I mean, gone are the days where we were saying that uh, software skills are the skills that you required, you know, to, to get along. And this we have seen from, you know, early, I would say 2000 and two, it has worked till 2015-16. Now, I think the entire entire concept has changed. It's not only software, but you also need an engineering behind that. I mean, 
earlier what you used to is that somebody was doing engineering somebody was doing software engineering somebody was doing analytics somebody was doing something something this is not the case now probably you need to build that case because any system that we are looking for is actually going through different levels right so i mean anybody is good at software engineering does not mean that we have a complete team to go for a system so you really need to go i mean i mean if you if you really if categorize into this you don't need only software you also need an engineering skills you also need analytics skills you also need social skills i mean that would be probably coming to your surprise right security what are the people are looking for so those are the social and security skills also that has become relevant so my take on to this is that as an organization tech mahindra or any other uh, company for that matter we are trying to focus on all these four five category of skills probably trying to divide that into a, what could be the right proficiency levels required and you are using that all those uh, you know courses available for us to get into this that's how we are trying to handle that great thank you sanjeev so a follow on question to um both actually and sanjeev let's start with you again so the, you uh, we understand that lot of reskilling or learning has to happen but there are lot of new skills that are being uh, you know coming up with this new technologies are you guys is there any like top 5 skills how are you guys prioritizing and deciding which skills should be focused on for the current at least for the near term relevance for the employed workforce yeah i'd like to answer that it what is the current mega trend that we are seeing in the industry i think iot everybody is talking about iot and uh, if you see any analyst report i think i think everybody would agree to this that this is going to be something which is really you can't stop it uh we are also seeing the trend of video becoming most important thing right so and for to carry the video you would need a larger bandwidth which is coming from 5g so i'm just trying to relate that if you really want to pick up you know top 2 3 uh, initiatives or top 3 mega trends i would say that from a telecommunication perspective from a network perspective 5g is going to be there it will enable a lot of things through video capability and this is where the iot uh, systems would pick up there are many things which we are still you know uh, thinking that it will be coming there are many things which are under trials right now but will come into the uh, picture and i think the another mega trend that we are seeing is from uh, automation right so all all those operations which we are doing currently will get an automated and it also emphasize on to that that the people on the ground have to reskill because many of those jobs would be automated through bots and everything right so that's also uh, actually supports the fact that uh, a reskilling is a uh, mandatory requirement right now. Thank you. So, Pallavi, let's go to you. Um you're from HR and you're also leading the um the learn L&D department, right? So, so you heard both Anurag and Sanjeev talk about the reskilling needs. At Tata Communications, two things um the two questions I have for you is one, how are you are you seeing the similar pattern in your organization for reskilling needs and also Since you are on the HR side, how are you? What kind of challenges are you facing when you guys are going to colleges and recruiting the fresh college graduates who are required to be able to perform on these new technologies? So um, I think, um, as for whoever knows a little about Tadacom, uh, you would probably recognize us as the old VSNL. So we are uh, largely uh, a network provider, right? That's what we are. but over the last couple of years we've been working very hard to transform ourselves into a digital infrastructure provider essentially that means that we've got horizontal technologies and we've got our own uh, products in the space of iot uh, cloud security mobility etc which uh, you know we can bundle with our network right now that's a very different skill so you're absolutely right we are we are in a situation where we've got a whole bunch of telecom engineers yeah but what the the growth engine for the company is going to be these five or six big uh, areas that i just called out to you and so it means that there is a seismic shift if i may say in the kind of skills and talent we need in the organization now that always almost always results in the debate of build versus buy should we 
build and develop talent internally? How much effort, time, energy should we be investing behind it? Or should we be simply going out there and recruiting for the best uh, available talent in the market? And I think at the end of the day, every organization will take a call which, has, which says that in some combination, both of those will have to work, right? So we're in the space of saying we will develop uh, some of our talent and we will go out there and we will get the best talent available. And how are we developing talent? So uh, to be honest, we, we recognize that not, it's not everybody's cup of tea to kind of take on the latest technology, learn it and learn it in, in, in a manner that they're able to use it and deploy it at the workplace, right? So we actually have something called a learning agility test. We allow our employees to take something like that. It allows employees to see what is their own ability to learn, right? And only from that then do they get recommended certain areas which they could probably see future careers in, which could be areas in the future skills area or could be more aligned to what they do presently. And that's perfectly fine. Everybody must have the option of deciding where and what they want to choose amongst that. And that is what we are trying to push very hard in the organization, allowing people to really understand what is it, uh, what's in it for them and how can they probably shape their careers differently because that is the need of the R. We can't allow all of our employees who may not necessarily have the skills in the future tech space to just go. Right? So we have to do something to help them, uh, you know, create longevity for their own careers, maybe in different areas. But then it's also for us to uh, get fresh talent in and get new, uh, you know, people into the organization and balance that. So for us, it's, it's a bit of both. We're doing both right now with getting the best talent in, plus we're helping our own talent develop in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a lot of the future skills areas, because those indeed are our future uh, growth areas as a company. Great. Thanks, Pallavi. So the second question I had for you was, are you guys facing specific challenges when you're trying to hire the fresh college graduates? And typically, what are you seeing? Are you seeing that it's a long learning um, you know, period for them to be able to perform the jobs that are required for today? So um, I'm going to be really honest. I think the, uh, what we really enjoy uh, when we get our fresh grad talent into the organization is enthusiasm, the, the willingness to learn, the ability to learn quickly and you know adapt quickly etc because there's very little unlearning to do right. Uh, however on the flip side it's not necessary that they come in with all the skills that are required for them to you know kind of hit the ground running that doesn't happen. So we in fact have quite uh, in our tech spaces where we get our graduate trainees and we've got actually quite detailed in-depth programs, uh, 60, 90, 100 day programs where people actually come in, they learn. Uh, we've also got something called a marketplace, a project marketplace, which actually allows people to practice learning. So I come from the HR learning space, so people would know the 70, 20, 10 of learning. So 70 happens on the job, right? So we created a marketplace such that people can practice their skills, can practice uh, you know, things that they've learned so that they don't go in cold after learning a new learning a new skill on a platform or a MOOC or something like that. And we've realized that without doing that, I think we'll be letting down our fresh graduates because they don't necessarily always come in with all the required skills. Great. Thanks, Pallavi. So if time permits, I'll come back for the same question to you, Anurag and Sanjeev. But let me move on to Amit. Amit, you're from edX, and you heard the industry folks talk about how skilling, everybody has skilling and reskilling initiatives, and they all realize that there is, that there is a skill gap, right? Um, you being part of the training industry, how are you aligning with the companies on their requirement, and what do you think is your value add to these companies? Sure. So uh, for those who don't know what edX is, uh edX is started edX is a not-for-profit organization it's started by MIT and Harvard University with a vision to provide access to high quality education to everybody within a short span we have about 130 plus top ranking universities of the world like Oxford Berkeley Columbia Harvard IIT Bombay I am Bangalore and a number of professional bodies like Microsoft Linux World Wide Web AWS offering their courses on the platform now, there are a lot of content providers out there. What's unique about edX is 
because of the virtue of being a not-for-profit and a mission-oriented organization, we offer a, almost all the in-demand skills and technologies ranging from artificial intelligence, machine learning, communication skills, data analytics, etc. And all these courses are designed by all these universities. And the best part is, all of these courses are offered absolutely free. And the learner has an option to go for a certification from these universities. Now, unlike other academic institutes, we don't just create these courses in silos. We have a collaboration with most of the uh, industry bodies. We have our own corporate advisory board that comprises of leading organizations from all industries like Google, Samsung, Microsoft, IBM, GE, Genpak, etc. They all tell us what is the skill gap that they're seeing in their organization. What is it that their fresh hiring, you know, fresh newly hired talent or their existing workforce, what's the skill set that's missing there? And how the platform provider like edX can do a better job imparting those skills at a scale. We then take this feedback back to the universities and tell them that industry is looking for course nuggets. They're looking for micro learning. They're looking for modular learning. They're looking for learning on the go. So we create this whole consortium and then we deliver these courses online. We work with most of the major companies in India and across the world, I would say. And uh, the way we work with them is we identify their learning needs. We do the content curation for them. We make the courses available for them. And then these organizations use it to hire the fresh talent and to upskill the existing workforce. So Tech Mahindra is a classic example sitting over here. So Tech Mahindra wants to hire people at scale in all the emerging technologies like AI, ML, big data, etc., etc. And edX has just the right courses available on our platform. They, they range from, let's say, six weeks to about six months. And all these courses, the content is reviewed by the leading corporate. So, the match is definitely there, the relevance is definitely there, the learner who completes the course demonstrates that they have what it takes in order to be job ready. And companies are recognizing it. What they are going out to say is, anyone who completes these courses online has demonstrated a proof that they are job ready. So they can come and apply to us. Companies like TechM and GE are giving them guaranteed interview opportunity. So they come on board, they are job ready, they get their work done. Now you talk about existing workforce. Uh, the existing workforce, the kind of skills that they have acquired in their formal education, that usually depletes within six to seven years. So the 70, 20, 10 rule applies there. They constantly upskill themselves, but the organizations always have to think whether they create the content or whether they use the existing content out there. And because our content comes in from the, let's say, the mecca of the education world, they simply pick up off the shelf content offer it to their uh, learners, and they take it at their own pace and convenience. The third option that's also working well for us in developing markets like India is we offer blended learning. So we partner with uh, companies like NAIT and Pearson, because in India one may say that pure online may not work, pure offline is already failing us. So they need a blended learning approach. Corporates are using that blended learning approach, these partners like NAIT and Pearson are using that blended learning approach wherein they take the content from edX, add their own value-added services, local industry case studies, how an artificial intelligence concept which is delivered by Columbia University, how that can be applied to a local Indian context. They do that value addition and make the student more relevant. So this is how we are trying to stitch the entire ecosystem. And one last thing that I would also want to add within the statement is uh, we are working actively or very aggressively in stitching the entire ecosystem. Today there is a crazy rat race out there to get admission into Ivy League universities or IITs and IIMs. Millions of dreams are dying every year. So with that vision in mind, what we are trying to give them is the access to high quality education should not be a deterrent. I mean, one should always get access to high quality education whenever and wherever you want. So you go ahead, take these courses, employers are recognizing it, and our courses are also credit back. What it means is, if you complete certain courses, there are companies like TechM and GE who are giving you an interview opportunity. At the same time, you can also convert these credentials into on-campus degrees because universities are giving you credits, which is equivalent to 25% to 50% of their academic value. So that's how we are stitching the entire ecosystem. Great. Thanks, Amit. So um, I have another question for you, but I want to listen from Carl. Uh, so Carl, you have been, 
in this training business for a long time. You guys have been developing the platforms. You have your own enterprise uh, platform. You, but you are a partner for future skills um, here. So I want to hear from you. How do you think the initiative that NASCOM has on future skills is going to help reskilling the dream that we have for about two million people on these new technologies? Great. Um, thank you. I hope you can uh, hear me well. So we focus on uh, two problems. Uh, number one is uh, providing a relevant uh, learning experience for the learners. And the problem statement there is there is an overwhelming amount of content. Um, There's about 2.5 billion pieces of content that is uploaded on the internet on a daily basis, uh, including free and paid content. Uh, there's a tons of different course providers, there's assessment providers, there's virtual labs providers. So the problem is not about uh, access to the content, the problem is about discovering the right content. So the learners are completely confused uh, where to go, what to do. So leveraging uh, you know, AI and machine learning to be able to discover the right content. And Amit mentioned you know, the first pillar for future skills is discovery. So if we don't solve uh, the discovery problem, uh, you can have a lot of great content, but people are not going to do anything about it. Right? Uh, as uh, Amit mentioned, you have fantastic courses from Ivy League universities for free. Right? Uh, and, and there are many, many providers like that, but your people are not going to, your employees are not going to learn. So the first thing is that uh, to provide a great discovery platform, and to do, to do that, uh, what we provide as a platform is a aggregation and a curation capability, and keep it like an open ecosystem uh, so that everybody can participate, right? Uh, we don't want to create silos, because if you look at enterprises, uh, they have many, many learning systems. If you see large enterprises, uh, they don't have just one LMS. They have five LMS in just one company, right? They don't have just one content provider. They have 30 content providers. So every enterprise has a lot of capability, and yet if you ask their chief learning officers or even their CEO, they will say that skilling is not happening. Learning is not happening. Uh, the engagement is less than 5% in every single LMS. So check your company, less than 5% engagement. Uh, and that also for mandatory learning. When a CEO will mandate something, 5%, 95%. <laughs> In the large MOOC platforms, 90% dropout rate, which is publicized, right? So, so why are people not eating such great food if all this great food is available for free? So we have to solve the problem of discovery, and that's what we started at Stanford University about five years back in that cast uh, to solve that. The second big problem is that it is not about putting people into courses. So in the last 25 years, if you see L&D, what they do is that they, they buy an LMS, they buy a bunch of catalog or content provider, and then they prescribe, right? And people run away from it. So what it tells us that if you're really listening to the learner and if we are being user-centric and not being administrator-centric, we have to actually provide the choice to the user rather than prescribing to them. And we have to have a cultural shift and the mindset shift in how learning happens, which is let the learner feel the self-motivation and let the learner feel that they are in the driver's seat as opposed to being told what to do, right? Uh, we all know the growing experience. If our parents, I mean, especially in India, I grew up in India, uh, you know, your parents tell you what to do, and my parents told me become a doctor, I did the, exactly the opposite, became the engineer, right? So the more you prescribe people what to do, they actually run away, right? So the second big piece is make everyone a continuous learner because the requirement, this, uh, you know, there's a question always asked, which skills are hot in demand, right? We go to the World Economic Forum and they just published uh, in Davos this year the 20 skills for 2020. I can bet you that by 2019, that list is gonna get revised, okay? And it's gonna be 80% wrong. So the question is not about which skills are hot or where are in demand. The important thing is that if we all make our people and ourselves become continuous learner, lifelong learner, and we all start you know, becoming agile in our learning, so we, well, the second big thing that we are doing for future skills to uh, answer Divya's question is to bring that mindset shift to that it's not about throwing people into courses and it's not about classroom, it's about making your people continuous learner and lifelong learner. Even if you all learn 15 minutes and if you watch video, it, it, it seems like you know from the old from the old pedagogy and the old paradigm, people think that if you are not completing a course, you are not learning. And people tend to criticize when we started EdCast that oh, if you're watching a video or article, so what? That's not course. That's not completion. 
but that's the mindset that we have to fight. And we say that, you know, as you read articles, as you read video, you get motivated because the fundamental problem in learning is not about course, it's not about content, it's not about platform, none of that. The fundamental problem is motivation. A person who is motivated, who could, he could be a taxi driver's son and will learn everything. And you can have a very rich person's kids who has everything, the best platform in the world goes to MIT, doesn't learn and do nothing, right? So the first problem we are solving with that second pillar of continuous learning is make people self-motivated. Even that video they will watch, the article they will watch, the comments that they make is fundamental shift in the mindset over a period of time. We can't be impatient in expecting results tomorrow because in the course-driven world, you know, people are saying, oh, look, I got 30, I got 3,000 people trained on this course. So I check mark, I did my job. Nothing, no effectiveness, no nothing. But you know, the people who are the providers, they take a lot of pride and say that they got the job done. So that's the second piece. The third pillar as a platform provider that we enable for future skills, what Amit talked about is, is the marketplace, which is that we want to bring the best content, the best assessment provider, the best virtual labs. So we had to build a platform which is very flexible, very modular, and it supports multimodal, which means that it, can, it has to support micro-learning and macro-learning. It has to support self-prescribed, self-directed, and somewhat prescribed. It has to support mobile first and web. It has to support a course-centric learning and a subject matter expert created learning, what you saw in Amit's slide, that your own, the person who is sitting like 50 yards from you in the office could actually teach you the best thing than MIT. But you just didn't recognize that person, right? So the, the platform could potentially help you to recognize that. And we are seeing that with Wipro, by the way, Anurag has done a great job. TACM has done a great job. They have actually brought, activated their own subject matter experts who are actually picking and choosing content from edX, from other places, and then they're curating their own pathways, which are highly targeted, highly relevant within the context of their business. So those are the three pillars that we are enabling. And that's the pedagogy or the philosophical mindset of what uh, uh, Future Skills is about. Great, Carl. Um, we'll come back to questions um, because of the way the quiet zone is. We'll just one last question and then we will we'll have take a couple of questions from the audience. So Carl, great. It was great to see your passion and <laughs> just how passionate you are about the whole reskilling in initiative. So just last question to the panelists. Just one thing if you would say, Anurag, you guys are using Vipro and like Amit has mentioned and Carl has mentioned, one of the biggest active thing we're seeing from Wipro is your experts coming on board. You representing Wipro, what would you say one thing about the future skills, how it's helping in your reskilling initiative at Wipro? Yeah, uh, as I said, you know, uh, future skills uh, platform, uh, you know, we are able to create the learning paths for people. So people are at different levels of maturity in the organization, right? So some people who may have already know, uh, you know, uh, let's say half the skills, but they may want to go a little deeper onto level two, level three, versus some people who just want to understand the basics or level one of a particular skill. So we have actually created a lot of learning paths, smart cards for people on the future skills platform. So a lot of people uh, in the organization, it could be very senior people who come in there and they pick up the cards which they feel is relevant to them or they want to learn those particular platforms. So at this point of time, it is a very recent phenomena when we launched this platform to all our employees. Uh, you know, we have, at this point of time, while well, we have launched it to all the you know hundred thousand employees, uh, at any given point of time, we have about three to four thousand people who are really active uh, in learning and become picking up these things. I would just like to add one more thing: uh, a lot of freshers who join us, uh, you know, from campuses, uh, they are people who they are people who are actually uh, we have hired them now. They are going to join us in the month of June next year. Uh, uh, what we have done is we have actually opening up some platforms to those people where they can learn a lot of stuff even before they come and join us. So at least the foundation level is something we want them to be uh, comfortable with when they come and join us uh, uh, you know, in June. And when they join us in June or July, at that point of time you only you know, start creating buildings where you start teaching them all these new technologies on big data, AI and cyber security and all that thing and that is where we'll use platforms like Future Skills to do impart the knowledge. But we don't spend time on the foundation skills which we have done it while they come in here. And the last point there is that while people learn a lot of technologies, we have also, you know, uh, you know, complemented uh, these uh, future skills in other platforms with a lot of hands-on environment. So we have got a crowdsourcing platform where we have 
created uh, close to about 80 development skill platforms where somebody wants to learn, let's say, Angular or a cyber security or big data, uh, the people go to these platforms, they get the theory knowledge, they go to our uh, crowdsourcing platform and they actually download the learning assignments, case studies and even live projects which we have put on the platform and they start getting a lot of uh, uh, hands-on experience. And the, uh, and the uh, hands-on experience they get on live projects, they actually can earn money as well. So it's a great motivation for them that there are a lot of internal as well as customer projects on the platform. They learn a technology on future skills and other. They go there, pick up a learning case study, do the dirtying the hands, and now they become experts over a period of time frame. That way it's a continuous learning life that Carl mentioned is a, is a culture change that you are bringing about in the organization. Great. Thank you, Anurag. So I know we are short on time. So we will go to the audience. Could I request the panelists to please wear their headsets so we can take the questions from the attendees? So um, could somebody help the attendees with the mic? Thank you, panelists, for a very engaging discussion. My name is Anita, and I'm from this institution called the Institution of Engineering Technology. Um, a lot of discussion on both the demand side and the supply side. And I, f I genuinely feel that there is a shift in the skilling responsibility that we are seeing, you know, is it the individual's uh, sort of responsibility to pick up more skills? Or is it the employer's responsibility to impart skills to make the employee employable? So in a, in a context where there is so much of job insecurity and there is career insecurity, where career spans are only about five, five years, corporate ladders vanishing, etc. So in all this conundrum, when you have the entire representation of the industry together, that's a, that's a great thing. But uh, how do you see this as uh, progressing? Do you think that the, uh, you know, only those employees who pick up skills and become, you know, probably demand king's ransom for the kind of skills they are picking up. So there are only about 50 AI specialists in India, if you look at it. So would, you, would that continue to happen? And how about the less protein kind of employees, you know? How about those who are not so high on the self-regulated scale? What about the rest of us, basically? So I'll, I'll have one person answer this question because we have another question yeah. from the front. Anurag? OK, uh, so let me, let me answer that question. It's a very good question because many people in the organization who feel that they have developed a lot of equity on certain skills are feeling little insecure. That is a, that is a fact. Uh, what we are trying to do, M, is, do is the first we try to bring, a, bring in a stick policy. Okay, if you do not do this skill, you know, I will not give you maybe your quarterly uh, percentage of your quarterly compensation and all that thing. It created a lot of negative energy in the, in the ecosystem. Then we came with a lot of positive uh, thing. You know, first we tried to make a lot of heroes who learned. Now, uh, our CEO has given a thing that if you get into a program, you fail, no negative marks, but if you actually come out, you know, we are looking at roles in the organization that these people can graduate to or progress to. Now that has created a lot of positive energy where we have a program for senior managers who, uh, you know, who are trained on these new digital skills. Now, the question of whether the individual will be able to learn or not learn, frankly, is not a big deal because, uh, you know, uh, uh, some of these new skills when you uh, people have the learnability element. The only risk is that if you are not able to perform the or learn to the extent that you want them to learn, what happens to me? Believe me, in a services organization like us, where we work with a lot of customers, finding these roles for individuals, one, who can be pure managers, second, who can, you know, like a, a, a full stack guys who can even dirty their hands and work in a customer engagement, is where the creativity comes, where you are able to place these people into various roles in, in a service organization with customers has created a lot of positive momentum amongst the people that if they learn two skills in a year, they actually get a kicker or a bonus or a change of role. Uh, and that has driven a lot of people to start learning these new technologies. So actually, uh, request Anurag also to take a stab at the question. Uh, sorry, Sanjeev, my, my bad. Um, I would like to answer that from a different perspective, from a learner's perspective, right? That was more from employer's perspective. Uh, from learner's perspective, one thing I strongly believe is that everybody wants to be respected, wants to be recognized for something, right? So I think earlier it was great confusion where to go, what to go. 
good part about this industry now and at least in the last about a decade or so the recipes are very very clear the ingredients are very very clear now it is the learner's perspective you can look at from two per two ways one is that if i don't eat i will die the second one is that if i eat if i eat a good food to my liking it will help me and the culture around me i think now the there is a shift in the learners approach as well right this is not about what carl was also mentioning right the now i think the people are aware of what they want what is needed out of them and they want to get a respect everybody i think all of us sitting here is some way or the other are committed to ourselves other than the organization's commitment i think that's the level which keeps us motivated that's the learner's view of uh, i would say and this is probably the greatest motivation for any employee to become relevant to stay relevant stay significant so that they can contribute and uh, i mean i can i can take many examples but you have maybe i d- i don't want to you know put any percentage but let's say if you are x percent committed to an organization then definitely there is x plus delta x which you are committed to yourself so that's the thing that is really very really required and that will keep you going that's how i think thank you sanjeev i know we're really short on time there was one question you can take it with the panelists later or if you want to take do you have a question back sir okay please direct it to one of the panelists because we are really short on time so apologies for that uh my name is ajay mukreja my question is to call uh, i was listening to what you were talking about uh one of the future skills where you need to now start looking at is empathy how do you create co-creation collaborative competitive environment not just for employees in the organization but in public at large uh in india i don't see any skill developmental work going on in the area of empathy well that's a fantastic point so thank you and for uh, your compliment sorry um uh, yeah that's a fantastic uh, point i want to compliment you for bringing that up so compassion and empathy are fundamental soft skills that's actually going to become far more important now in this fourth industrial revolution than it was ever before because a lot of hard skills stuff will be done by robots and many other things but all of us uh, you know the human workers uh, will have to have a very high level of compassion and empathy um i think one of one way to foster that is to have the social collaborative learning environments where you do have a, you know coaching and mentoring will become very important so all of us will have to play the role of not just managers or individual contributors but we will have to take on a role of a coach or a mentor uh, we'll have to take a group of people and we have to feel uh, you know their pain empathy as you said and we have to start sharing our knowledge because if we are in the old world people made money by holding knowledge in the new world people are going to make you know successful by sharing knowledge so one of the things we actually have support in the future skills is this ability to be a collaborator and ability to be a subject matter expert and what i mentioned the example of uh, the subject matter experts from wipro and tech mindra is doing is kind of empathy because they are actually taking their knowledge that tacit knowledge and they are bringing it out creating pathways and learning pathways and then offering it to people and then they are available digitally 24x7 to be able to answer the question so they are actually acting as a role model but we have to do more but uh, i i really congratulate you for bringing that up fantastic point thank thank you to all the panelists and all the attendees um the panelists will be around here so if you have any questions for them please let's take it offline from here because the next session is starting and Roger is looking at me and is like okay we need to start the next session so thank you again thank you amit and thank you panelists again